Good afternoon. It's a blessing to be back at Christ Bible Church after our trip. Some of you were not here last Sunday. And, uh, uh, I think what we'll do is uh, be sending out a report, a written report, and then God willing, next Lord's Day, uh, which will, uh, we will have our annual business meeting as well as our fellowship meal, I'll give a short report of our trip to Nigeria. Turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans 12, we continue our study in the book of Romans. Title of the message today is Finding Our Function in the Body, Part 2. Follow along as I read verses 3 through 8. <clears throat> For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And now I'll read verses 6 through 8, which is our text today in the Amplified. Having gifts, faculties, talents, qualities that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them. He whose gift is prophecy, let him prophesy according to the proportion of his faith. He whose gift is practical service, let him give himself to serving. He who teaches to his teaching, he who exhorts, encourages to his exhortation, he who contributes, let him do it in simplicity and liber liberality. He who gives aid and superintends with zeal and singleness of mind. He who does acts of mercy with genuine cheerfulness and joyful eagerness. Just by way of review, since it's been a few weeks uh, since we've been in Romans, uh, you'll remember chapters 1 to 11 the Apostle Paul describes the doctrine of salvation. He covers pretty much the full gamut of all the major doctrines connected with salvation. The doctrine is also known as soteriology. But in chapter 12, we arrive at a, the first major division of the book after the first 11 chapters. And in this chapter, the attention shifts how a Christian should live out these doctrines that we've learned in chapters 1 through 11. So the outline of chapter 12 is as follows. Verses 1 and 2, which we've already examined, we see the Christian's relationship to God in which we learn how to live a holy life. In verses 3 through 8, the Christian's relationship to the church in which we learn how to exercise our spiritual gifts and we're still in that section today, and God willing, we'll complete it. And then the rest of the chapter, verses 9 through 21, we see the Christian's relationship to all men in which we learn how to love all, both saved and unsaved. Now, because salvation just begins God's purpose for the believer, we now move to the next stage in accomplishing this plan by understanding our relationship to God, to the church, and to the world. Salvation does not end the matter. Unfortunately, some teach that in effect, salvation does end everything for the Christian. It has, in a de facto way, become the do-all for and the be-all for the believer because after becoming saved, they hear the same repackaged salvation message drawing from different scriptures over and over and over again. And so, in my view, the doctrine of sanctification and other related doctrines are greatly neglected because of this. The scripture teaches that salvation just begins God's purpose for the believer. 
And Romans 12 and following teach us how to apply the doctrine of salvation. But there are other doctrines besides salvation, like sanctification. And we have basically a whole chapter devoted to explaining how we apply all these doctrines to our lives and actually live them out as we understand the person and ministry of the Holy Spirit that is taught in chapter 8. And there is much teaching connected with that to the doctrine of sanctification in chapter 8. So it's a critical chapter, that is chapter 8, in helping us understand how to live out these doctrines. And now we have, with the parenthesis of chapters 9 through 11 concerning election and the nation of Israel, both from a national perspective and the individual aspect of the election, now we pick up again in the area of practical application from chapters 12 through the end of the book of Romans. You see, it's God's will that you and I work with other believers to form a functioning body. Not some kind of institutional hierarchy, some kind of mechanical inner workings whereby we can have an organized church with every piece in its proper place without anything else. Man has this wonderful tendency and ability to organize everything. But the church, though it does require organization, the Bible says, let all things be done decently and in order. Unfortunately, we tend to shift our focus from things spiritual to things organizational. And some like to, well, maybe they don't like to, but they act as if as long as everything's organized and the church is growing numerically, everything's okay. But that's not what the doctrine of the church teaches concerning the nature of the church and the purpose of the church. The church is an organic institution that is called the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is connected and joined vertically to the head, the Lord Jesus Christ. And our, there's, there's this whole world of internal spiritual workings and life that's taking place both in a vertical sense. There's life passing between us and Christ and Christ and us. And there is also life that is passing and should be passing between the members of the body, one with another on a horizontal level. And that's the world in which we should be living. One percent or less should be devoted to organization because if we get the internal workings and organic unity and life and oneness of the body correct, everything will take care of itself. Some of us of us has, have used that phrase over and over and over again to describe the importance of majoring on the main majors with regard to the church. If we just get our relationship with Christ right, everything will take care of itself. But it's true. And this is what we prayed about this morning or this afternoon in our prayer meeting. Lord, give us more of the Holy Spirit. Give us more love. Give us more life and power. Give us more of thy grace so that we can function spiritually as your representative spiritual institution in the world so that we can convey and propagate the truths in the power of the Holy Spirit that you would have us to as those who are witnesses for you. But it all begins with that vertical and horizontal relationship, spiritually speaking, with the Lord and with one another. That produces or should produce a tremendous amount of spiritual life that propels the church forward and causes it to grow spiritually. Seeing the fruit of conversions and the growth of the members spiritually who are, who are increasing in their love for Christ, hungering more deeply to know Him. So it's God's will that we work with other believers so that we can be a better functioning body. And this is done in the local church, when all the members function properly by exercising their spiritual gifts. I hear a lot of people putting the church down through 38 years just about of, of being a Christian and 31 of them as a pastor. I, I have, the church has been a, a whipping post for everyone who've had, who have had, who's had bad experiences and scars and have, have left the church. Such a person and others like them mm -hmm. do not understand the nature of the church if they end up like that. When we understand what 
God did when he created the body with all of its components and it's the plan he had for it to function whereby if we do God's will as a church we can bring so much glory to him and that's what was intended to begin with mm -hmm. then if we just walked away from the church wiping our hands clean as a maverick and just staying at home as a scattered sheep worshiping the Lord the Bible says that God has given us spiritual gifts. We'll learn about them in our text today, in verses three through, uh, or six through eight. We read about this in Ephesians four. Turn to Ephesians four, verse seven. God's plan for the church. Someone was saying to me yesterday, you know, I don't like it when people just come to church and occupy a seat. We're to have a relationship with one another. It's not all about just coming to church, sitting down, and when the service is over, over going home, and not thinking about the person sitting next to you, not praying for the person who is in need in the body of Christ, not seeking to reach out to that person who is in need, or the individual who is not in need, because many people in the local church, many members, if we follow this blueprint properly, will be ministered to even though they don't have any needs. Just in the process of exercising your spiritual gift that God has given you and me, we will be reaching out to people who seem spiritually full. Because that's what God commands us to do. Verse 7 of Ephesians 4. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Verse 12. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now verse 12 tells us the reason... The purpose why God gives us a gift. And if this is not being done in the local church, then we're missing something somewhere. We need to be equipped. We need to be doing the work of the ministry so that two things can be accomplished. First, the body of Christ be edified. We are commanded to exercise our gift in relationship to one another that causes edification in someone else in the local church. Is that going on in Christ Bible Church? It needs to be, because that's the purpose for spiritual gifts. Mm -hmm. He's designed these gifts, gifts to be applied and function accordingly. Continuing, verse 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In other words, in verse 13, we see that there is a progression not only are we to just randomly exercise spiritual gifts whenever we want to, as if we have an option in the matter, no, but we see a progression. We see that there needs to be this proactive drive and pushing towards the perfecting of the local church, the local body of believers. We're to be exercising our spiritual gifts until we all come to the unity of the faith. If there's disunity, among the brethren, well, there, when you exercise your spiritual gifts and persevere in showing sacrifice, sacrificial love to one another, that will tend to unify the local church. That will tend to work out the schisms and the disagreements and the contentions among us. And also, it will cause the knowledge of the Son of God. There's a vertical blessing when we're exercising spiritual gifts. I come into a deeper head and heart knowledge of Jesus Christ. And when a, when a brother comes to me or a sister and offers a word of encouragement, perhaps they don't know I'm discouraged or depressed or going through a trial. The Holy Spirit superintends that process and sends that person to me to speak a word of encouragement. That individual believer who is sent to me needs to be open and available to be used by the Holy Spirit with his, his or her gift to encourage me. And then, when I am encouraged, I very often come into a deeper knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man. The goal here in the exercise of gifts is completeness, to be a, a healthy local body of Christ, unto a perfect man, maturity and completeness. Now, if you take out this huge component resulting in church growth, spiritual growth that God has designed and ordained 
to grow his body. If you take that component out of the equation, can you see how the, the life and growth of the local church can be stilted and warped and weak? So this idea of spiritual gifts is very important. It cannot be placed on a back burner. We need to have a positive, proactive approach in not only understanding but applying the doctrine of spiritual gifts in order that we might be a vital instrument of God in edifying our brothers and sisters in the local church. Christ gave us the gifts because he loves my brother and my sisters and he loves me so much as a believer, he wants to use me and send me to them so that they can be edified through the exercise of my spiritual gift in their life. And so many of our reformed churches have not only missed the whole doctrine of the person and ministry of the Holy Spirit, but this very pragmatic doctrine of spiritual gifts. And of course, the one is so closely related to the other. If you're not going to emphasize the need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be equipped with the, with the knowledge and wisdom and power of the Holy Spirit, to serve God as we ought to, then certainly spiritual gifts will be something that you're not going to be able to relate to very readily. You see how important this idea of spiritual gifts is? And finding our function in the body? There's no such thing as sitting in the bleachers in God's church. We are on the field taking a vital, purposeful, functioning place in the machinery, in the engine that is called the Church of Christ. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So Christ is always seeking to lift us up and fill us up to the fuller and fuller knowledge of the Son of God. Knowledge which He imparts to us as we exercise our spiritual gifts in each other's lives. So Paul begins chapter 12 with an appeal in verses 1 and 2, as I said, to live holy lives. In verses 3 through 8, he encourages believers to fulfill their place in the body of Christ. And in verses 6 through 8, he addresses our, our, uh, our responsibility to exercise spiritual gifts, but then in verses 9 through 21, to love all people. Now, you'll remember in our outline, in the first message, we looked at three of four points in the larger text, which is verses 3 through 8. In verse 3, we learn the importance of humility as church members, humility in our role as Christians and in our place in the body of Christ. But we also learn the, the necessity of diversity. There's diversity of gifts. There's diversity of people, both physically, emotionally, personality-wise, as well as spiritually. And then, verse 5, unity. And now in verses 6 through 8, we look at ability. Ability, the four of four points concerning finding our function in the body of Christ. Let's then look at verse 6, the first phrase, under this whole idea of ability or gifts. Having then gifts different. Now, the focus of this phrase bears heavily on the word gifts. Gifts. God is talking about you and I having a gift or an ability. Some of you know what those gifts are. Obviously, the elders and the deacons of Christ Bible Church are serving in their office and utilizing the gift that God has given them. But how about the rest of you? Do you know what your gift is? He's given you one. And God's laid down principles in the Bible for the regulation and the functioning of spiritual gifts in the local church. We call this the doctrine of gifts. The doctrine of spiritual gifts. Now let's look at some of the biblical principles of the doctrines, doctrine of gifts. We looked at these in detail last time. I'll just mention them briefly. I may pause at one or two of them to add a little bit more light uh, onto what I already said. But first of all, we notice that every Christian has a spiritual gift or ability. Secondly, we mentioned it is a spiritual gift. Not only because the Holy Spirit supplies this gift to you, it's not something you can learn from a book or go to school for, like some churches try to teach others how to speak in tongues through a, in a classroom setting. It's a spiritual gift. 
and it is supplied by the Holy Spirit. It's not a natural gift. And the Holy Spirit must help us develop that gift and use it for His glory. Thirdly, spiritual gifts are designed to edify the body of Christ. There's a purpose in the exercise of these gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. The ultimate aim, as we read about in Ephesians 4, 12, of using our gifts is to edify the body of Christ for the profit of all. 1 Corinthians 14, 12 says, Even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to assemble. Excel. The Corinthians lost sight of the purpose of spiritual gifts because they were introspective and they were looking for personal edification from the exercise of these gifts. But God says, look, I know you're zealous for spiritual gifts, but let it be for the edification of the church, not for selfish self-aggrandizement or to get some kind of public recognition that you're so gifted. Romans 15, 1 and 2 says, We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his, his good, leading to edification. So edification is the ultimate goal of much of our Christian service and outreach in the lives of other people. Not only in the church, but outside of the church but especially in regard to this area of exercising spiritual gifts. In our activities and ministry in the church, we should not be self-centered, but focused on the good and edification of others. Number four, some believers have more than one gift. Some believers have more than one gift. And there can be a combination of gifts. Sometimes a pastor has the gift of, uh, not only the gift of teaching, because he is at, he's to be apt to teach, he's to uh, be apt to teach, as 1 Timothy 3 talks about, but also the gift of shepherding. He can also have the gift of exhortation or more. And the same is true with other believers who may not be pastors or deacons or church officers. They may have a combination of gifts. Number five, we are not to glory in the gift or the person who has it, but in the Lord Jesus Christ who gives the gift. The minute you take your attention off of the Lord, both from the perspective of the one who has the gift, the one who's exercising the gift, as well as the person who's receiving the, 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 the blessing of the gift, he's the beneficiary, and begin to look on each other, then we lose sight of this principle. The gift has been given to us by the Lord, we're not to glory in anything or anyone but the Lord Himself. Mm. Number six, the gifts are God-centered and not an end unto themselves. This works hand in hand with a couple of these other principles, but it is, it does take on a separate thought here. The gifts are God-centered. If you keep that in mind, it will help you relate properly to the exercise of gifts. In other words, everything is moving in the direction of God in the local church and in the world. One day God is going to roll up the heavens like a scroll and everything and everyone will bow the knee to Jesus Christ. Christ's preeminence and the glory of God will be the only thing in view in that last day. And everything until then is moving in that direction, including, the, and that includes the functioning of the local church. Everything is to be God-centered. Everything we do in the local church is to be done to direct people to God. In other words, the focus of gifts is God-centered, not man-centered. And the ultimate purpose of gifts is not to bring attention to itself or to us, but to bring people to Christ, but to glorify Christ, but to cause people, because of the exercise of our gifts, to praise and worship and magnify the name of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Number seven, the gift is to be exercised, cultivated, and developed. You and I may recognize that God has given us a gift and we may have the right attitude and perspective about using that gift, but that won't help you exercise that gift if you just recognize that. The gift has to be 
cultivate it. You have to identify what the gift is and develop it and exercise it. 1 Peter 4.10. Turn to 1 Peter 4.10. This is a critical passage with regard to the doctrine of gifts. 1 Peter 4.10, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. The three principles in this verse, first of all, each one has received a gift. So vertically, the gift has come down from heaven, from God to us, and each one has received the gift. If you're a Christian, whether you realize it or not, God has put a gift inside of you. You have received it. It's in there. Second principle. Minister it to one another. So the gift has the design to be used. You have to use it. And in doing so, you have, you, it has to be used in someone else's life, in the church. The gifts have been primarily given to be used within the atmosphere and context of the local church in the lives of other believers. Are you doing that? This is what God commands. Are you doing that? Well, it takes a definite acknowledgement of this as a doctrine of Christ. It requires us to be convicted about it. We have to have clarity in understanding what this is all about, and then we've got to go for it. We've got to identify what our gift is, which means we've got to pray and pray and pray until God shows us what that gift is. And sometimes we have to experiment. We seek to, uh, or we think we are given a certain gift or ability or talent, we begin exercising it and we realize, no, that, that's not for me. I'm not called to be a pastor, or I'm not called to be a teacher, or I'm not called to be a deacon. And we try something else. And you say, no, 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 that, that, I don't have the gift of exhortation. And then you try something else. Oh, wait a minute. The, the Lord's really blessing me in this ministry. People are getting edified. I'm getting comments from people that they thank God for my ministry of mercy, for example. Ministry of showing mercy. And I personally get gratified and edified when I see others getting blessed and edified, leading to the glory of God. That, it just thrills me to see God getting glory by my meager, unworthy ministry of showing mercy to others. We've got to identify the gift. Once we know what it is, we find our place in the church and we just, for example, start showing mercy to people if your gift indeed is the gift of mercy. Everyone is to show mercy as a Christian, but there are certain believers who have some of these gifts, gifts in a much more intensified way, which rise it to a level of a special gift called a spiritual gift. And those gifts are to be used in the lives of other believers. Now as a Christian, we're, we're called to show mercy to everyone, are we not? The Lord says, be merciful, even as your heavenly Father is merciful. Now we may show mercy to many people in the world, unsaved and saved alike. But there is a special gift called the gift of mercy that is to be exercised within the confines of the local church. That is in the lives of other Christians, not necessarily within the four walls of a building. We are to deliberately exercise our gift of mercy in the life of another believer. We're to go out of our way to be looking for opportunities for, for the exercise of, of, of our gifts. Before church, pray, Lord, help me show mercy to somebody, one of my brothers and sisters today at Christ Bible Church. And lo and behold, watch the doors open. You'll find out needs all the time. Well, I'm sick, or so-and-so is sick. Get on the phone, call them. Can I, can I bring a meal to you? So-and-so just got laid off, and it's going to be a few weeks before unemployment kicks in. Can I, can I give you $100 or $200 to help you over the hump till you get the unemployment check? The gift of mercy. But this is an example of how this gift is cultivated. And the more the gift is developed, the more confident you are that... This is indeed the gift that God has given to you to use in the local church. You'll have all kinds of tokens and evidences of blessing in the exercise of this gift. 
As time goes by and you refine the gift more and more, you, your, your level of fruit bearing will go from 30-fold to 60-fold, and from 60-fold to 100-fold, you'll be bearing fruit all the time. And because you're, cult you're always in the process of trying to do better and cultivate the gift to a, a more proficient level of, of exercising, uh, you'll be bearing more fruit than you did at the beginning. As the scripture says in John 15, that, that if, if we are connected to the vine, we will bear fruit, more fruit, and what? Much fruit. So there's a progressive uh, acceleration of fruit bearing in, in, in the whole cultivation process of your gift. And then once you're, you're totally settled on what your gift did, is and you get, you get divine and uh, confirmation and, as well as from people and from your own heart that this is your gift for the rest of your life. You're just in the driver's seat sitting back using your gift. You don't have to revisit all those questions that you used to struggle with at the beginning. What's my gift? Do I have a gift? If I do have a gift, how do I exercise it? And Lord, what, what's my gift? I've been saved for 20 years now. I need to get on with the business of serving you in the church. You see, we're called to more than just being evangelists, sharing the gospel. Spiritually, we've been given a gift, and that gift is to be used in the church. So there's an ecclesiastical element of our calling, as well as an evangelistic aspect of it as well. We cannot neglect one or the other. We must be faithful in both. Amen? This is the truth. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So the third point in 1 Peter 4, 10, is that not only are we to minister it to one another, but as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So this gift, is, we're, we're accountable. We're a steward. Did you know that? That's what it says here. When you're given the gift, you're given an area of responsibility. It may not be much. You may have a gift that does not bring you into the public eye when you exercise it. It may not be in a very visible way, but God gives you a gift. He commands you to be a faithful steward in exercising that gift. You are required, if you don't know what that gift is, to seek Him, to get His wisdom and knowledge. He'll give you the wisdom. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it will be given to him, but let him ask in faith. You need to be putting this on near the top of your prayer list. You can't go on year after year, decade after gift, decade, neglecting this stewardship that God has given you and me. Because there's much fruit to be born in the lives of God's people for the glory of God. Let's get on with that work. So this week, let me give you a practical assignment as we move on in our study of Romans. This week, begin praying, Lord, what is my gift? If you don't know what your gift is, what is my gift? and be relentless before the throne of God. Be persistent. Be earnest in prayer about it, and God will show you. It's been my joy in recent months, the last three or four months, to have dealings with two or three of you concerning how you might serve the Lord at Christ Bible Church. And in my communication and dealings with the brethren along these lines, two or three of you have identified what your gifts are and you're in situations and places where you're serving, where you're serving and you're getting joy out of it and you're seeing some fruit. And that blesses me because I know in the, in the end of all that, God's going to be glorified. And that's my reward, is it not? And that's your reward when you see God glorified through all the, the exercising of your gifts and God gets glory, that's what we live for. You couldn't pay me enough to gratify me, monetarily or otherwise, compared with the gratification and sense of fulfillment that I get when I see this big sinner do something to glorify God. Because I know that those works will follow me into the next life. Everything I do of self in this world will stay here, right? And don't tell me, well, you know, Pastor Joe, I don't have enough time to do what you're describing. Well, it's not what I'm describing. It's what the Bible's describing. And if God commands us to do something, don't you think he'll give us a situation to enable us to put that into practice? You say, but my, my present job doesn't allow me to serve the Lord in the local church. Change jobs. 
Pastor Joe, how can you be so curt and so, you don't understand my situation. Change jobs. What's more important? Well, Pastor Joe, my financial situation is such that I've got to work two to three jobs. You know, I've got heavier, pay off your bills and then don't get two more jobs. Stick with the one and then spend time serving the Lord in the church. It's very simple. But in America, well, I don't want to get started on that. <laughs> I'll never finish this message. In other words, our culture and our society militates against us having time to serve, time to pray, time to think without technology bombarding us from every direction, to think our own thoughts, to, to even think about brethren, sisters, brothers, children in our church and their needs, and to even go wonder of wonders, one step higher, to pray about those brothers and sisters and their needs every day. That's what really brings the burden of my brothers and sisters' needs down to the core of my heart, which causes me to move and serve and help them. It drives me forward in helping them through intercessory prayer and the exercise of our gifts because I've got the time to do it. Amen? Amen. Amen. You say, but if I change jobs, you know, there goes my mortgage payment. I won't rent. It's not a sin to rent. I rent. I don't have any retirement. I'm proud of that. Because God has provided for me. I don't need five safety nets in America. If I lose this, then I have four guarantees that this will take over. Or if I lose that, then I have seven guarantees that this will kick in and help me and take care of it. What? What a blessed nation we are to have all those safety nets. But in, a, in another sense, we're a cursed nation because of it. Right? Because we rely too much on man, and not on God. <sighs> Hallelujah. It's wonderful in, in 2014 to be able to preach like that without fear, the fear of being persecuted in my own church. <laughs> and I thank God for that. And I thank God for you brothers and sisters too, that I have the freedom to do that. You know, I would, I would preach it that way anyway until you ran me out of the church. But I do thank God that, I, that the Lord through you have given me the freedom to say that in all good conscience from the Word. So what we're saying by this critical verse in 1 Peter 4.10, if you're to be a good steward of the gift God has given you, you must use it, you must minister it, you must exercise your gift in the life of another child of God or in, in a group of Christians or in a ideally in the context of the local church that you are a member of. Now, you've heard of the term, use it or lose it? Well, anything that's not used becomes weak and calcified, right? Becomes dormant. Hebrews 5 relates to, to the fact that if faith is not exercised, if you don't stay in the Word, reading it, studying it, meditating it, you go backwards, you lose some knowledge of God, you forget about the memory of the glorious fellowship and union you've had with Jesus Christ through the meditation of the word and prayer. You go backwards. The same thing is true with our spiritual gifts. If I don't preach every Sunday, I get a little rusty. I, have, I haven't preached at, uh, well, I preached last night at, at the San Quentin prison. But before that, I had not preached for a couple of weeks, and I, I thought to myself, driving in this morning, uh, that I, I, you know, if it wasn't for last night fine-tuning me, I, I, I wonder how I, I would be doing today. I know it's all the, the grace and strength of the Holy Spirit, but the gift itself needs to be developed, okay, and used. You need to be faithful to it. Number eight, the gift can bear fruit. The gift can bear fruit. We talked about that. I'll move on to number nine. Exercising the gift will glorify God. We've already woven several applications and principles in with this point. Exercising the gift will glorify God. And number 10, the believer is responsible to identify and develop his or her gift. We talked about that. So to summarize, our responsibility is one, to exercise our gift. Number two, seek the power of the Holy Spirit in using it. And number three, to seek spiritual fruit 
from it for the glory of God. Mm. Now, moving on in verse 6, we read the next phrase, according to the grace that is given to us. We're to minister the gift according to the grace that is given to us. I suggested earlier, those of you who don't know what your gift is, God promises here to give you grace, not only to find out what that gift is, but the ability to use it and develop it for His glory. God promises to supply grace in order that you might use your gift for His glory. He's not going to give us a gift without the grace to minister it and refine it. Right? God doesn't tease us. He doesn't dangle a carrot. And when we reach for it, He pulls it back. No. God doesn't mock us. He doesn't play games. He's commanded us to exercise our gifts and use them. And when we seek Him in wanting to do that His way, according to the blueprint laid out here in Scripture, He will give us the grace to do it according to the grace that is given to us. This word gifts comes from the Greek word charisma, meaning extraordinary powers. And so the gifts enable believers to serve the church in an edifying way resulting in growth in the body. When the body grows, that's how the church of Jesus Christ in the world advances in society. That's how we take more territory for Christ. That's how the kingdom of God gets built up and spreads out where people get saved, where the believers get edified and bring glory to God. Not only during public worship, but also when no one's looking in our prayer closets. We find ourselves worshiping God more fervently, praising and thanking Him more frequently when growth occurs in the body. Then the next phrase, let us use them. This is a very emphatic and strong language in the Greek. It's a command. It's not in, in, it's not in neuter. It's a command. Let us use them. Use what? The gifts that he just mentioned. Are you using your gift? I'm commanded to ask you such a question. I'm commanded to bring forth that implication. Are you using your gift? If not, what's taking away that time? Lack of desire, forgetfulness, busyness? Well, bring those hindrances to the Lord. What he commands you and I to do and exercising our, he'll make, he'll make a way for us to be able to fulfill that command. And he'll do so not reluctantly, but enthusiastically. He'll help us find a way. Do you believe that? Well, faith takes the first step towards God. So often when we obey and take the first step, God meets us in the doing of it and provides everything we need to accomplish his perfect will. Very simple. Let us use them. Now, let's look at the gifts, number one, which is the next phrase. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. I could spend five messages on this one gift alone, prophecy. Through the years, I've learned a lot about this gift, and in preparation for this message, I've spent a lot of time re-researching this gift. And so we're not going to get caught up in controversy, but we're just going to say clearly that in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, this idea of prophecy here in Romans 12 is not necessarily referring to prediction, predicting the future per se. There's an element of that in the word prophecy in general, but this particular gift, uh, it's not the predominant thought here. It has a little bit of it, like I said, but primarily, Prophecy is the inspired delivery of warning, exhortation, instruction, judging, and making manifest the secrets of the heart. When one stands up and prophesies back in the early church and in the Old Testament, those kinds of things were done through the exercise of prophecy. Warning, exhortation, judgment, instruction, making manifest the secrets of the heart. And yes, there is some element of predictive events that are bound up in prophecy, but, but again, that isn't the predominant amount of the prophecies. So, in the Old Testament, we obviously know that there were prophets. We have many books uh, 
title by their names, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Malachi, Hosea, and so forth. These were Old Testament prophets. Mm. The New Testament equivalent of the Old Testament prophets were apostles. Apostles. You see, there are different levels of the gift of prophecy, different levels of authority, and different levels of the gift itself. Mm. So we cannot take the idea of prophecy and think there's one size that fits all. There are different levels of the prophets, the office of prophet, and different kinds of prophecies and gifts of prophecy. There's the Old Testament prophet and the New Testament prophet. Ephesians 4.11 says that he gave some apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and so forth. That verse identifies the office of New Testament prophet. Now remember, the Old Testament prophet, I said, was on the level of a New Testament apostle. And the reason why is because the Old Testament prophet eventually brought the inscripturated word of God. And the same thing is true with the apostles. They had the gift of prophecy. And many of them brought the New Testament inscripturated word of God. Now, the Bible teaches in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 and following that prophecy will cease, as well as the other temporary, extraordinary sign gifts, like speaking in tongues, word of knowledge, and so forth. The Bible says clearly that these gifts will cease. There is a period of time, and I believe it's in the first century or early second century church, when these extraordinary gifts will cease. The, the office of apostle, along with the gift of prophecy that they had, will cease. Now there's a second level of prophecy in terms of position, and that is the office of prophet. There's the gift of prophecy in the apostles, which were a higher rank, a higher office than the prophet, but then secondly there was the New Testament prophet, who had the gift of prophecy. And then thirdly, there was another form of prophecy in the New Testament where individual believers had the gift of prophecy. And when you read 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, we see the Apostle Paul laying down instructions for the proper exercise of the gift of prophecy, the gift of tongues, all of these sign gifts. Because the sign gifts can get easily out of control. They so thrill not only the spirit but also the flesh sometimes that the believers who have these gifts focus on themselves and on the gift itself, and they blow them out of proportion. And Paul keeps having to call these believers in Corinth back to uh, sobriety and remembering the purpose of the gift of prophecy is for edification, not for your thrill. Wow, I'm a prophet, or wow, I'm exercising the gift of prophecy. Wow, I have a word from God that you don't have. No, it's all about edification. <laughs> what I say as a prophet in uttering my prophecy edifies the body. It's the information that is communicated in the prophecy that will edify the communal body of believers. That is the goal. It's not you, Mr. Big Shot, that has your gift of prophecy that is the end in view here. No. So we have... The prophetic gift in the apostles who wrote the scriptures and before the New Testament scriptures were written, they also gave forth verbal prophecies received from direct revelation. Then there was the New Testament office of prophet, which had a more intensive, intensified gift of prophecy than the average gift of prophecy, which some believers have. All these gifts of prophecy have been ceased because they were sign gifts. And all the sign gifts ceased because faith takes over where sight leads off. And we can go, we can debate this day and night, uh, but, and you may not necessarily agree with me on this, but still be a wonderful believer, a wonderful Christian uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. But, so when we talk about prophecy, we're talking about basically proclaiming the word of God. In its root meaning, that's what it, Suggest proclaiming the word of God. But then, obviously, these other three gifts and offices that I just described take it to another level where they're bringing forth 
the Word of God to a local church situation or prophetic event, future event, or warning, judgment, and so forth. Remember, the New Testament canon took a long time to complete, and God raised up these special sign gifts, some of which had the communication of the Word of God connected with it to fill in between the Old Testament scriptures and when the New Testament canon was completed, to fill in with a body of knowledge and information that all the local churches needed to have. Can you imagine being a member of a local church in Smyrna or Rome or Corinth or some other city and only having the Old Testament? But you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're, you're not a, a slave of the law. You've been, you've been made free, bondage to sin has been broken. You're a new covenant believer now and you've got all this freedom that the Old Testament Jews did not have. All they had was the Word of God, the dead letter. And they had no joy, no peace. Most were un unconverted. Now, here you are since Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the church. Light has flooded into the church. All this knowledge about Christ and the person and work and perfections and excellencies of Christ have come in for us to be able to learn and study and experience and apply, but you have no New Testament scriptures. So you're dependent on these prophets and these others who have the word of knowledge and speaking in tongues and apostles to come and give you prophecies, give you the prophetic word, along with some of the parchments that have begun to be copied some of the epistles that, that begun to be copied. But you, you have scanty amounts of the word and you're leaning on every, every word you can get about this, this Christianity thing, this new covenant Christianity. You're wanting to learn as much as you can, but then when the scriptures are completed, that which is, when that which is complete has come, when that which is mature has come, when that which is perfect is, has come, and when you read the context of First. Corinthians 13, he's talking about partial knowledge compared with complete knowledge, which the New Testament scriptures are not only complete, but sufficient. Are they not? Is the New Testament sufficient to direct us and guide us and teach us everything we need to know about our faith and practice? Is it or is it not? It is. Read 1 Corinthians 13 and other passages. So the Bible does teach a, quite a bit about these other forms of knowledge in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and in other places, the book of Acts, and it's the Gospels. But we learn through the doctrine of proper and biblical interpretation that the Old Testament is interpreted in the light of the knowledge we have in the New Testament. And within the New Testament, the former knowledge we have, like in the historical books of the Gospels and Acts, are always interpreted by the latter books of the epistles. So the, most, the latest information very often modifies, abrogates, changes, and sometimes completely cancels out previous information in Scripture. And we always interpret the oldest information by the newest information, right? That's a biblical rule of interpretation. And that's, why we, that's another reason why we see that the gift of prophecy has ceased. All right, number two. And I have about five minutes. I'll try to do as many as I can in that time. Or ministry. Let us use it in our ministry. Now, this word ministry here is the Greek word diakonia, where we get the word deacon. In essence, it means servant. So somebody who ministers can be a deacon in the official office of deacon, but also can be a believer in the church who has the gift of ministry. You say, well, what? there's no office of ministry. What do you mean ministry? Well, I know what this gift means because there are some people who just love to minister. They're not a pastor. They're not a deacon. They're not an evangelist. They're not occupying any official office in the church, but every time the church door is open, they're there. They just love to minister. Wherever the saints are, they're mingling with the people of God, ministering, serving, washing feet, doing what they can. They just love to minister. Who are they ministering to? Well, ultimately, they're ministering to the Lord. 
Because when we minister to the people of God, we minister to the Lord. Inasmuch as you've done it to the least of these little ones, you've done it unto me, Jesus said. And people love to minister because when they see the people of God blessed and edified, they know that God is glorified. It's the gift of ministry. And pastors and deacons need people like this, dedicated people. It's not to say people who have other gifts are not dedicated. No, no. But there are, and I could name three or four right, right now, I'm not going to do it, people in this church who have the gift of ministry. This is someone who serves, who renders service in the sphere in which God placed them in the local church. And it's the gift of ministry. It says, ministry, let us wait on his ministry. This, this idea of waiting really, unfortunately, is a bad interpretation because it's not there in the text. It literally means just be occupied with the ministry. It, it means any kind of service from dispensing the word of God to the administering of the temporal affairs of the church. It, it means being occupied with your ministry. Maybe you have the gift of ministry. Pray about it. Maybe it's one of two or three gifts that God has given you. Number three, he who teaches in teaching. Now there is a distinction between the office of teacher and the gift of teaching. Obviously, the one who occupies the office of teacher also has the gift of teaching. But then there are those who are not called to be in the office of teacher that are able to teach. They have gifts to teach. Now again, remember, these are spiritual gifts. Some may think, well, what about a woman? Is a woman given a gift to teach? Well, a woman is not given a spiritual gift to teach. She may be able to develop a natural gift to teach. Many of our mothers teach children and do a fantastic job. They're great teachers as teachers go. We have women who are public school teachers, college and university professors, women who teach in many other settings other than the context of the local church. But God only gives a man the gift to teach in the context of the local church. And if you read 1 Timothy chapter 2 and 1 Corinthians chapter 14, the Bible, if the Bible is going to say, I permit not a woman to teach, nor usurp authority over the man, but is commanded to be in silence, and says that again in 1 Timothy chapter 2, is God going to give her a gift to teach when he commands her to be in silence and says she's not to be a teacher in the church? God would be contradicting himself. Now, that's not putting down women. I'm not a chauvinist by any stretch of the imagination. I do believe that women have three, three areas where they can teach the Word of God. The older women are to teach the younger women how to love their husbands. And if a woman would give herself, an older woman in the faith would give herself over to that with a lot of her spare time among the younger women in the church, that would, that would suck up a good 10 to 15 hours a week of teaching the Word of God in, in an informal, personal context with another woman. Secondly, mothers are to teach their children the Word of God, are they not? Of course, under the supervision and direction of their husbands, but nonetheless, mothers are to do that. Now, thank God! Thank God, children! You young people who have been brought up in Christian homes have had fathers and mothers teach you the Word of God from when you can remember. Some of you, like my wife and I, read the scriptures to our children when they were still in the womb. We had devo family devotions when they were in the womb and outside the womb. So, teaching the children. And then, of course, women are able to share the gospel, the Word of God. Yes, with men, again, in an informal context, outside of the formal gathering of the local church. Look at Priscilla and Aquila, who pulled Apollos aside and taught him the word of God more accurately. An informal context, where the authority of the man is not usurped in a public forum. That dishonors God. As we, and that, 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 that uh, ordinance of submission, it's like a creation ordinance. It goes all the way back to creation which we don't have time to talk about. 
This is a tremendous gift, the gift of teaching, because it, it has a direct bearing on a large amount of the believers. And teachers are expressly distinguished in the New Testament from prophets. Remember, it says in Ephesians 4.11, apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, or pastors and teachers. And so the teacher exercises a lower function than that of, again, a prophet and an apostle, which are both temporary gifts that are done away with. The permanent gifts, we believe, are pastors and teachers and deacons. Those are the permanent offices in the local church. There's an office of teacher, which is not necessarily uh, this teacher given the gift of pastor. But you can have the office of teacher. And I think we have that in this church, with one or two at least. Well, we'll stop there. And I would be remiss if I did not give at least one or two brief applications the first one would be, are you using your gift? Is this important to you? Do you know what your gift is? Is this important to you, brethren? It's important to our church. Christ gets a direct benefit from all the members of the body identifying their gifts and using them. It's not about me, it's not about you, it's not about any one individual. It's about all of us using our gifts for the glory of Christ. Are you using your gift? God's gift is always enough for any believer to glorify God and be fruitful. You don't have to be another Charles Spurgeon. Just be faithful. God's measure and standard is faithfulness. Not brilliance. Not wealth. Not having 5, 10, 15 gifts. It's faithfulness. So faithfully identify your gift. Faithfully develop it. Faithfully bear fruit with it. Faithfully take up your place in the local church until the day you die and you be faithful in using your gift and you will hear well done thou good and what faithful. faithful servant enter into the joy of the Lord Don't compare yourself to other people. Well, I'm not like pastor Joe or I'm not like brother Walter or I'm not like pastor Owen or I'm not like so-and-so God doesn't judge you by that standard just be faithful in what he's given you. Settle into the local church. Identify your gift and give yourself fully to it in serving the Lord. Don't compare yourself to people or you'll find yourself always complaining or envying that you're not like this person. Or you'll get involved in church politics behind the scenes trying to find favor, curry favor with people. And that... that diminishes God's plan for the exercise of gifts among the members. But if you take your eyes off other people and just use the gift God has given you, then you may not accomplish as much as they do, but if you faithfully use your gift in the sphere God has placed you, then you will bear fruit. Remember, some the, the, the ones who were given talents, one had five, one had two, and one had one. Not everyone is given the same amount. Don't judge yourself by the amount of gifts or abilities someone else has. If God has given you one talent, use it to the fullest. Spurgeon said, if God is satisfied with himself and sufficient to his own happiness, therefore surely there's enough in him to fill the creature. That which fills an ocean will fill a bucket. That which will fill a gallon will fill a pint. Those revenues which will defray an emperor's expenses are enough for a beggar or a poor man. Didn't Paul say, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus? And he sees fit to bestow these riches on us as an inherent gift. Let us pray. Father, we pray that as your church here in this world, as you have called us to defend the faith, and to grow and not be stagnant as a local church and to always be growing towards the, the filling up of the measure of the fullness of the stature of Christ. How can we do this unless your people are convicted deeply about this truth of spiritual gifts? 
How can we do this unless your spirit work in their minds and hearts and imagination to show them what their gifts are and to give them joy in using them and edifying the, the body with them and bearing fruit with them. Oh, we pray that your spirit would indeed so work in all of our hearts and minds that this would be accomplished. Even in these days where we feel like we're living in a dry and thirsty land, when so few have an appetite for the word of God and a hunger to, to obey the commands of God with respect to the local church, to be the church that you want us to be. Help us, Lord, help us. Each and every one sitting in this room, each and every one listening that is a Christian, a believer, help each one of us to apply this doctrine of spiritual gifts to our lives, that we might be faithful stewards of this gift entrusted to us by you. And use that gift until you come again. Oh, even that we might see you glorified while we yet live through the exercise of our gift, Lord. Oh, would that not be our reward, Father? Help us. Hear us, we pray. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.